Well, a very good morning to you all today. How are you doing on this fantastic Sunday morning? I hope your heart is ready uh, to worship the Lord. And uh, that's what exactly what we want to do today. We want to magnify Him and bask in His love today, for His love for us. Um, just a quick note, uh, on the screen behind me, you'll see a phone number, 417-860-5378. And that is a that's Pastor Tony's phone number, and this is how we reach out and connect today. If you're a first-time guest with us today, welcome. We want to hear from you by just texting, just by saying, hey, I am here to that phone number. If you have a prayer need or anything you want to communicate to the pastoral team, please also use that phone number as a means of that communication this morning. Well, we are going through the series on Love Does, and uh, we are being encouraged by being people who love um, unconditionally, right? Right. First John four nineteen says, uh, "We love because God loved us first. First John four seven says, um, "People of God should love one another because why? Because God is love." So today, Pastor Tony is really going to take us through some really practical means of how we can express that unconditional love uh, to one another. But before he does, we want to join with one heart and with one voice, with many voices, I should say to worship the Lord. So let's stand to our feet and let's do that this morning. Father, we want to thank you for this time that we can gather together from a week that, Lord, has been filled up with different things going on in our personal lives. In this very moment, we can dedicate it to you, that God, that you would speak to us the power of your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts as we sing these words of praise to you, for you truly are a God who is beyond belief. You are a God who is powerful um, to meet us where we're at, powerful enough to help us in every situation possible. So, Lord, we just give you this time for you to do a work within us that brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
there's a grace when the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There's another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding of How I've been set free There's a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There's another in the fire Death left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world But the name that is Jesus He who was and still is And will be through it all So come what may in the space between All the things unseen And this reckoning I know I will never be alone Should I ever need me? 
joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I love that song, and I can tell a lot of you do too, and I can see that um, we're honoring God today. Um, as we're singing through that song, I don't know about you, but I think about um, fires that I've been through and how um, God was always there, always, always there. We're not promised that we won't go through trials, that we won't go through fires, but we have a Father who is always with us. He never abandons us. Um, I just want to read... Um, one of my favorite scriptures that talks about this. This is from Romans 8, um, starting in verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger, or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell, can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, 
Before we start our prayer, I would just say happy Mother's Day to you, to everyone here. And as we pray, lock in, lock in on a mom, lock in maybe on a mother-in-law, lock in on maybe a grandma, or maybe a person that's not even related to you, but they played that critical role in your life as counselor, as a mother, as a person who could nurture, and just think about them right now. And in this prayer time, can you say, Lord, bless them. Maybe that person is not here on planet Earth right now. Could you say, Lord, bless their memory. Bless their memory. Father, we come before you in this moment and we pray. We pray for our moms. We pray for our grandmas. We pray for those ladies who act as mothers to us, even if they are not. Thank you for their role, God. And Lord, I pray in this day, in this time, that you would bless them in incredible ways, that they would come to know your mercy in deeper ways and deeper levels than ever before. They would experience your grace and your kindness and your goodness. Their souls would be rejuvenated today and through this weekend, through this experience, through this time of 
of being blessed by family and friends around them. Oh God, may we make much of our moms in this day and age. These things we pray in your son's powerful name. Amen. Hey, go ahead and be seated. And kiddos, it's time for you to go to Kid Zone. So head on off, head on out. We got Paul there. So he is ready to go. And uh, it'll be a great time. You know you can connect and grab your kids on the other side of the parking lot after we're done here. And uh, want to say to you, welcome, welcome. Jay and Lynn, great to have you guys here. Welcome. For some of you who are new, Jay and Lynn were founding members of Northbridge Church, and, and they just chose to rebel and chose to act in an unrepentant way and move away from Springfield, Missouri. And uh, it's good to have you guys. So welcome. And uh, I'll say to everyone else, welcome here on Mother's Day. Uh, what a fitting time and a great time we are uh, starting. We started last week with Pastor Dave leading in a discussion time looking at love. Love does. I made a statement in Easter that was just a tagline at Easter, but really was meant uh, designed to be something that we would do a deep dive on. And that tagline, I said, towards the end, and I'm sure many of you who were here on Easter, you were hanging on every word I said. And you just remember this? You're like, yep, I remember that. That was about the 34th minute into the talk. Uh, it was the 10,000th word you said, Tony. The statement was uh, that you have... When we come to discover the gospel, when we unlock the gospel, we have the ability to do several things. And one of them I mentioned was that we can love at the same capacity that Jesus loves. I didn't say that we could love similar to Jesus. I didn't say that Jesus was the big brother in love. But I said that the amount of love that Jesus was able to show to this world, you and I have the same capacity. Now, that, so there'd be some people that would say, I'm a heretic for saying that. There would be some people that would say that I'm giving, our, I'm giving us, I'm in, imbuing upon us God-like property because only God can love the way God loves. And I say to that, that, that my scripture tells me, the New Testament shows me that the whole reason why Jesus came was to show us how to love like he could love. And so that's what we're doing now is we're taking a time uh, the next month to look at how love does. Here's what I know. When we unlock the gospel, we unlock a giant reserve of love. And this enables you and I to have vast amounts of untapped potential that's just in our hands. This, this potential empowers us to love like Jesus loves. And when I say the word love, and, and many of you I'm sure have heard this before uh, from many of a, other preacher uh, over the years, you know, we as Americans, we English-speaking people, uh, we really do a poor job describing love. Because I can, in the same breath, tell you how I love pizza. You know, we're going uh, to Branson West, and my hope of hopes, Dana, it's Mother's Day, Dana gets to pick where we're going to go eat, but boy, I'm sure praying that she's going to choose the mellow mushroom, because, because I love pizza. I love pizza. In the same breath, I can tell you how I love Dana and Dax as well. And I promise you this, my love for Dana and Dax is far deeper, is far grander, is far greater than my love for pizza. But, but you wouldn't know, would you? Because love is love is love, right? We have one word to distinguish love. The Greeks, they were a little smarter about this. They have, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, they have at least eight words. There are some Greek scholars that will say that there's up to 12 words that they have to describe love and the properties of love, the, the communication of love to people around us. The New Testament employs four of those words in love. And, and so we're going to take the next month, we're taking a week at time to look at one of those words. I'm going to spend time in the next three weeks. to, uh, to Next week, we're going to talk about phileo, brotherly love. The week after that, uh, I'm actually going to be in in three weeks or four weeks from now, we're going to be going on family vacation. And then the leadership team about a year ago asked me to consider doing a sabbatical, which I pay attention when your leaders are saying, hey, Tony, why don't you just get away for a while? You know, we, we're good. We're good. We got it covered. You know, why don't you take, a, take an extended vacation? You know, I pay attention to that. I'm like, huh, 
better pay attention when leaders want me away for a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to bless them and honor them. And, and so this is a thing that's been in the making for about a year. Uh, and I'm going to be gone for about four weeks. You're going to still see Dane and Dax around periodically. But we're going to do some traveling. I'm going to do some time just to get away and reflect and visit some other churches just to learn from other people and, and just, you know, just have some time to kind of refresh my vision and, and just expand my horizon. The last, I can tell you this though, the last Sunday that I'm preaching, I'm going to be preaching on the word, the, the Greek word eros for love, eros. That's where we get the word erotic. So I'm sitting there going, wow, this could be, this is my last sermon before I'm gone for a month. It could be really good. Or, you know, this could be the one where it's my swan song, Dave. It's like, yeah, I think I'm done now. I think I've said everything I could possibly say at Northridge Church, and, and it's time to move on. So we're going to be hitting that. But today, we're not talking about eros. We're not talking about phileo. We're talking about a word that most pastors walk away from and don't talk about. And they talk about eros more than they talk about this word. And I get it because there's, this word doesn't sound very loving. The word is storge. That, just even saying it, it sounds like something that should be like in a language from, you know, uh, Star Trek or, or, or Star Wars, one of those kinds of, you know, like Klingon, right? Storge. How, how do you, you know, if I looked at Dana and just said, Dana, I storge you, she's going to be like, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to drive separately next week uh, to church. Storge, what is it? It's describing this family love. It's the idea of these bonds that are deeper than, than just, just being neighbors to one another. They're bonds that are, that are even deeper than what sexuality can bind people with. This, this is the idea of this family love. It's, it's talking about loyalty. It's talking about protecting one another. It's talking about showing kindness to people even when they don't deserve it. Uh, uh, it's a very practical and familial love. Now, the truth being told, the word storge is not found in the New Testament. You can't find it. You can't find the word storge. You can find the derivatives of storge. You can even find the opposite of storge. That, the opposite of storge, for the record, is a word called astorgus. Astorgus, it means without natural affection, without natural bondings. It's used specifically in Romans 1 and in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is these are passages where Paul is talking about what does it look like when a society, what does it look like when a culture gets so far from God's love, and he gives these descriptors, and one of the things he's saying is, is when, when a society, when a culture is so far from God's love uh, that even family bonds break down, and people, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, husbands and wives, cousins, they, they don't even love one another. They don't even have affection for one another. They don't even show kindness within the family, that there's no, there's no sense of loyalty. There's no sense of kindness. And, and those are some of the things that Paul is saying. And here we are today now talking about storge. I don't believe it's an accident that on Mother's Day we're talking about storge. What can I say today to bless you moms? And moms, I see you out there. And I say, blessing to you, blessing to you, you deserve this. What can I say to you to bless you today so that you walk away going, wow, I feel like my time at Northbridge was well used. Well, another question I ask as I was preparing this talk is, what should we give moms today? What, what can I say to bless moms? And what should the husbands, what should the Brothers and sisters, what should the sons and daughters give their mothers and their grandmothers? I would argue it's the same thing. The answer to both of those questions are, is the same answer, and that is storge. Storge. The reality is this. The best moms, and hear this clearly, because I understand what the best mom is. I have a ribbon in my home saying, best mom detector. I know what the best mom is. And let me tell you, the best moms are kind moms. You know, at the end of the day, moms, you're not going to get a reward or an award because your house is the cleanest and your house is spotless. 
But if your kids see you and they know that you're a kind, kind heart, there's your reward. You're not going to get a reward because your child makes all A's all through school and has a great job and making six figures every year. At the end of the day, when, when you cash it in, it doesn't really matter. But when your family gathers around you on the last moments that you're breathing on planet Earth, and they look at you and go, there is a kind person. There is a loving person. Let me tell you, there's your reward. The best mom is a kind mom. And I also say this, the best thing that we can give our moms in our lives is our kindness and our affection. And I would say this for today as we look at Storge, that I know in the culture we live in that many of us, many of you are like me. My mother and my grandmother have passed away. Perhaps you're not in a family, perhaps you're not married, and perhaps the idea of a Mother's Day talk just rings, just kind of deaf to you today. Uh, understand that this talk also applies to just how do we live on planet Earth in a way that honors God? How do we live in a way in which we can tap those untapped potentials, those untapped vast reserves of God's love in our lives and in our ministries, in our workplaces, in our families. That's what we're talking about today. We start out in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Paul is writing to us and he's giving us some very practical instruction of how to live in our families, how to live on planet earth, how to live in our communities, how to live in our cultures as God's people. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. What is Paul describing here? He's using several Greek words to describe and define what I'm convinced is storge, kindness and compassion towards one another. So the question that is begged today is how do we clothe ourselves with kindness? How do we make that happen? It's easier said than done, let's face it. So what are some practical things that we can do to be able to be a little bit better at practicing storge in our lives to, uh, to, today? The first thing I would say is this, be sensitive. Be sensitive. What am I talking about? Tune in and become aware of the needs around you. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Don't look, we should be people that are not looking to our own needs or our own interests, but each of you to the interests of others, is what, is what Philippians 2, 4 says. In other words, hey, don't be just concerned about yourself, but look around the room and look around to the interests of people around you. Can I just tell you, when we think about this idea of being sensitive, here's what I would share and remind everyone. Can I say this? Everyone here is having a tough time in today's world. Everyone here is having a little bit harder experience living today than you did five years ago. I'm confident in saying that. I'm not even going to take the time to say, hey, raise your hand if you're having a tough time right now. Because here's what would happen. About 40% of you would raise your hands, and the other 60% of you would not. And you know what that tells me? Well, we got 60% of the room that are liars today. Because the reality is we all are dealing with tough times. Now, there's some of us that like to you know, watch John Wayne movies. I'm one of them. Clint Eastwood movie, and I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and so therefore you'd sit back, and when someone's saying, hey, are you having a tough time? No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, okay, does your blood pressure tell, you, tell us that you're having it? Does your blood sugar tell us? Does the fact that you're maybe a little closer to having a stroke and stroking out than you did five years ago say something about are you having a tougher time today than you did five years ago? I think so. Let's face it, this world has just been set up for the last two or three years to create it, put us all in a, a system and all in a, in a little, little universe in which it's just harder. 
it's harder to do the things that we've done before. I'm not saying that to, so that we all are patting each other on the back and talking about how tough it is. I'm not saying that so that we can all have these micro pity parties for one another. That does not help anything. But what I'm saying is, could we maybe give each other a little bit of a break, right? Maybe if you experience someone to the right or to the left of you a little bit rawer than you normally do, they have a little bit of an edge to them. Maybe instead of punching them and being like, I'll show you, you know, how dare you say this to me? How dare you insult me? How dare you offend me? How dare you uh, come at me with a little bit less kindness than before? And I'm going to show you, how about we give that person just a little bit more space? How about we give them just a little bit more room and give them a little bit more permission to just be having a tough time? And here's what happens. When you do that, it's just natural that then people around you see you giving people a little bit more space. Guess what? You're going to get a little more space too. You're going to get a little more kindness and you're going to get a little more permission to be like, hey, having a bad day? I understand. I understand. And you can, and you can have a bad day. But you know, the reality is it's hard for us to be sensitive to those people's needs, right? It's hard for us to remember that, you know what, I'm not the only one having a tough time here. Everyone around me is having a tough time as well. Why is that? For me personally, my answer is busyness. I know that when I get more and more busy, I'm less and less kind to people around me. Kindness takes time, friends, to, to communicate. Kindness takes time to develop. Kindness takes time to live out. And when I get caught up in my busyness, I am less kind, and I realize that when I get busy, Dana will feel it. When I get busy in life, Dax will know it, and they don't, I don't have to tell them a thing, but when I start getting busy and caught up in my agenda and caught up in my life, the two of them will feel it more than anyone else, but it does bleed out till if it keeps on going on, the entire church will experience me as being an unkind pastor, Right? an unkind person. Here's a test that I use for myself that I just give to you that helps me know that I'm going maybe in a critical zone or I'm in a critical place here. Uh, the test is I'll ask myself periodically, what are the three greatest needs of my family this past week? What are the things that Dax and Dana are dealing with that I have seen? And when I'm in a busy state of mind and I'm only focused on myself, I answer that, I go, oh, I don't know. I don't know, I guess everything's going perfect for them. But when I'm tuned in and dialed in, I can tell you, I can tell you, you know, testing was going on or the tough time at work for Dana. I could, I could name the, the three or four things that are going on in their lives that were critical for them, that were the greatest needs in our family. And, and it helps me go, okay, I know I'm tuned in. I'm tuned in. That's a question for you. Can you answer right now? What are two or three of the greatest needs that my family is dealing with in this moment? And that helps you see, are you dialed in? How do we develop Storge? We be sensitive to one another. But I also say this, we, we need to be supportive. Be supportive of one another. There's a lot of things that we can talk about uh, when it comes time to talking about support. But what I'm specifically wanting to dial in on today is our speech what comes out of our mouths, okay? Now, I asked you, I told you before, I wasn't going to ask you to raise your hands about are, are you living in a tough time? Are you struggling at this point? But I will ask you this. How many people here, at some point, at some point in your life, usually when you were probably in elementary school, some playground bully said something just terrible to you? Or maybe it was in pre-adolescence, or it was maybe your early years of of junior high, middle school, in which the, just some mean kid, just they decided to make your life miserable and you come running home crying because of something that someone said. And maybe it was terrible. How many by show of hands did you have a mom or dad say, hey, you know, little Johnny, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. So buck up because 
They're only saying things to you. Be thankful they're doing that and not beating you to death. Yeah, that's what my parents said to me. I'm like, gee, thanks. Okay, I, you know, now you're giving me a whole new level of fear here. How many people had a parent that, that you, you were counseled with that, coached with that? Anybody here? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something, and, and if you haven't figured this out yet, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but your mom and dad lied to you, lied to you. Jay, your mom's right next to you. If she said that to you, she lied to you, buddy. They lied to you because you know what I've learned over the years? That I have experienced broken bones that heal faster than a crushed spirit ever will. As a counselor, as a person who I have the privilege and the honor to talk to people all the time, and I've experienced men and women who are in their 40s and their 50s and a hateful word that was uttered by maybe a friend or a family member or even sad or a mom or a dad when they were 10, 11, 12 years old, still bouncing around their head, still bouncing around their heart and their soul. And the, the pain and the tragedy from those words are still coming to bear. I love what, what uh, Eugene Peterson, the author, uh, the translator of the message a version of scripture, what he deciphered in Proverbs 15, verse 4. And he gave us these, he said, kind words heal and help. Cutting words wound and maim. Do you support your families, friends? Oh, we could sit back and go, yeah, I support my families. Finances, I provide a, a place, a, a roof over my kids' heads. Yeah, I, I get them money so that they can play sports. I buy them their car. I pay for their insurance. I take care of their food. Yeah, I support them. Well, I'm not talking about just those financial things. And yes, those are oh so important. And yes, thank you. Thank you for being willing to support your family and your loved ones with that. But I'm also asking, do you support them with your emotions and do you support them with your words? Do you lift or push down when you speak? Do you give strokes or do you give pokes when you share? Friends, I'd say this. There are way too many of us that we belittle the people we're around. Maybe we don't belittle our families, but when we go to work, we belittle our coworkers. Or when we're at the, in the market, we belittle the people around us. Or we see that kid in the parking lot at the mall that has the pink hair and the weird haircut and the strange tattoo on their face, and we belittle that person because they look oh so different than us. And let me tell you, you're not the only one in that boat. Man, I'm right there with you. And we can belittle people around us. And do you realize that the true understanding of the word belittling is not that we are making other people little, but when we belittle, what we are doing is we are being little. You know that? And as we belittle people around us, that just shows how little we are. How do we show storge to people around us? Yes, we need to do things we've mentioned already. We need to be sensitive. We need to be supportive, but we also need to be in developing and strengthening the sympathetic muscle. We need to be sympathetic in how we conduct ourselves and how we relate to people around us. Romans 12 verse 15, Paul reminds us, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. What are we talking about? We are talking about looking around and saying, hey, you're celebrating. I want to celebrate with you. Hey, you're struggling. Can I struggle with you a little bit? You see, this is, especially for us men, that's probably one of the greatest things that we struggle with, isn't it? Because in our families, especially, when we see a problem, what do we want to do? We want to roll up our sleeves and become what? The chief fixer, don't we? We're going to, by golly, we're going to fix this problem. You got a problem? Okay, let me fix it. You know, let's build something and we'll fix it. Now, you got a problem with someone at work? Well, I'll talk to them. Or you got to deal with someone at work? Well, here's the five things that I would do to help you deal with this. And this is what you need to employ. I learned a long time ago, and I'm better at it now than I've been in the past. I still have room to go, but I've learned that oftentimes when Dana is downloading about how what the struggle is at work, 
back, you know, 10 years ago, I'd be like, well, what needs to happen is this, blah, 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 blah. And she'd look at me like, thanks, Einstein. I thought about that three hours ago. I'm just needing to talk to someone right now. And so I've learned to just, maybe if I say something, it's just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're dealing with that. But to just be there and not try to be a fixer, but be with the people in the good and the bad. Hey, here's something for, you, for those of you who are parenting teens or par- about to parent some teens. You, do you want, you want to, to, as you're parenting these teens, you want to own their heart? You want to have the key to their heart? I, I'll give it to you right now. And I'm just going to tell you, you know, last week Dave was apologizing because he's like, oh, what his exact words, which by the way, Dave, uh, multiple times my son was quoting you this week, uh, a direct quote. Uh, Dave was up here, for those of you who weren't around uh, last week, he said, yeah, I don't know, the other pastors must have been smoking wacky tobacco to have a single guy talking about marriage. Thank you, Dave, for that great pastor quote, because my son... My son is using that quote, and I'm just waiting to get a call from New Covenant Academy, wondering why the preacher's kid is talking about wacky tobacco. So thank you for that. Dave was apologizing last week about speaking into married lives. I am not going to apologize telling older parents who've been around a lot longer than I have about how to parent their teenage kid, even though I don't have a teenage kid. And the reason why I can have that kind of attitude is because I was a youth pastor for well over a decade, and I saw hundreds, hundreds of parents parenting teenagers through that decade, and I watched good parents parent, and I took note of that, and I watched bad parents parent, and I took note of that. And here's one of the things I learned as a youth pastor. For the parents that had their kids' hearts, and their kids came back after the teenage years, what was the difference? Sympathy. Sympathy. Parents who are able to show sympathy to their teenagers, those kids loved their parents. You know, let's face it. Kid wakes up and a giant crater on their face called a pimple, and life is over, right? Life is over. Oh, no, today is picture day. You get the notice your kid gets the appliance and gets the, the, the metal works in their mouth two days before pictures, and now they're going, to be, they're going to be known for the rest of life as brace face. And mom, dad, it's easy for us to be like, you think that's a problem? Hey, when I was your age, I was having to milk 25 cows and walk three miles to school. You know, that's how we respond. Our kids respond with us about how the person they liked is now going to the prom with another person and how life is over. And we respond by saying, so what? It's just the prom. There'll be more that come along. Don't worry about it. When we respond like that, even though for the record, you're right, you're right. These things are not life shattering. These things are not going to end life. But for your kids, you need to know that everything is a big deal, right? And when you belittle it, when you tell them their world is not that big of a deal, you're blowing off their concerns, just know you're blowing off their heart. You're communicating that what they're, what they're worried about isn't that important, and you don't really give a rip. Don't be surprised, friends, when you're old and gray and your teenage kids are adults. Don't be surprised if your kids aren't coming back to you. When you blow off their concerns as teenagers, they will blow off your concerns as adults. I guarantee you, and I've seen it over and over again. Practice sympathy. Be sympathetic. Galatians, Paul writes, therefore, in in chapter 6, verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of God, to the family of believers. What am I talking about here? Let us, as we practice these things about being sympathetic, being, a, being supportive, all of these things here, let's, let's be spontaneous. By that I'm saying this. When do you practice storge? When's the best time to practice storge? Here's the answer. Now. Now. 
Now it is. If you think of a blessing to give to someone, don't say, you know, at a more appropriate time, I'm going to share that. No, share it now. If you sense that you need to be praying for someone in your life, stop right there and pray for them. Don't go, well, when I get to my quiet time tomorrow, my quiet time's already passed today. When I get to my time of prayer tomorrow, I'll be sure to pray for them. No, you'll forget. Trust me, I know you will forget. Pray for them now. When you think, you know, I need to write a letter to someone and just let them know how they bless me write it, stop right there and write it now, write it now. If you think about, you know, someone just pops in your mind uh, and some of you are the recipients of this. Uh, there have been times where I've called many of you and I'm just saying, hey, I'm, I'm driving from point A to point B, getting ready to go into a meeting, but I just thought of you right now, just wanted to see how you're doing and just let you know I'm praying for you. You know how, what happened? That, that wasn't me waking up in the morning going, well, I'm going to connect to this person and this person, this person, this person today. No, literally you popped into my mind and I believe that that's God just provoking me to be thinking about the people who I get the privilege of shepherding. And so right then I want to communicate to those people, hey, God's prompted me to think of you right now. You know, how are you doing? And if I wait till a more calm time or wait to a different time, it will never happen. If you think of a need that you could help address, then deal with it right then. Be spontaneous. Do it immediately. And I just conclude today as we think of storge. We think of storge for our mothers. Moms, we think of you as being, being people who, who live out storge. But also as we think of just how do we live storge as people in this society, I just ask you a simple question. Will you be kind this week? Will you be kind? I have a, just a, 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 I'm convinced, I'm convinced that there are marriages just on the verge, just teetering from div to divorce or into health. And if just, not even both partners, but if one partner just said, you know what, I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to respond hate with hate. I'm not going to be vitriolic to people. I'm not going to be bitter or mean. I'm just going to be kind. I'm convinced if just one marriage partner said, this week I'm going to be kind to my marriage partner, I believe you'd be taking steps in the right direction. Kids are just on the brink of making either great decisions for themselves or terrible decisions. And if they just have one person in their life, a parent or a brother or a sister or a grandparent or a teacher that just responds with kindness in their life, oh, how that would push them in the right direction. What I've learned is as we practice kindness, people are drawn to us. Right? The old maxim, you know, attract, attract flies with honey, not vinegar, right? If we are just kind people, we're going to see that things, people just have a way of finding their way into our lives and we get opportunity to affect and influence more people than we've ever dreamed of in the past. And God gets incredible credit for that. And so for you, as, you're, as I'm just challenging you to maybe stretch and to, 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 to work out your storge muscle this week, here's the practical thing I'm asking you to do. Would you this week do three acts of unsolicited kindness to people around you? Now, I want to make it real clear what an unsolicited act of kindness is so that you get credit for what you deserve getting credit for, okay? Dave, if you walk in and Debbie asks you, Dave, would you wash the dishes for me? You can't wash the dishes and go, there's one, I did one, because guess what? That was a solicited act of kindness, right? An unsolicited act of kindness is when Dave walks in, he sees a mountain of dishes, and he just says, you know what? I'm going to do these dishes even though my wife hasn't asked me. Now, there's an unsolicited act of kindness, right? I'm challenging you, would you do three acts of unsolicited kindness specifically for your family, but if you maybe don't have a family, maybe you're an independent person, you're, you're, uh, you, don't, you don't have kids around you, or your kids are out of the house, you're, you know, you're a single person, then my challenge would be that the people that are around you, you would do acts of unsolicited kindness for. Caleb, I'm looking so forward to you doing three acts of unsolicited kindness to your pastor this week. I'm so looking forward to that, right? <laughs> I'd challenge you to do that. And here's how deep I am in this challenge. If you're saying, yeah, I'll do it, why don't you put a little skin in the game? Here's how you put some skin in the game. Up here on the screen is my 
my uh, phone number. You can see that if you're streaming us, it should be up on the screen as well. You can see that. I would invite you to text me today and say, hey, I'm taking your challenge. Here's what I'm going to do. There might be, if you're streaming or, not, or just new to the church, I might not even know who you are. I promise you I'm not going to next week ask you to do a report on Sunday and hear your acts of kindness. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not going to beat you up about it. But here's what I will do. I will, throughout the week, I'll text you and I'll say, hey, how you doing? How are you doing on this? Are you remembering your challenge? You, gonna, you, you, still, you still trying to figure that out? You know, I, I will do some follow-up this week and just give you a little add a boy or add a girl. Keep it up. Let's keep on doing this, right? I will do that for you. And, and so if you want to take this challenge, text me, and I'll be, I'll be your, your little uh, buddy in the corner saying, you know, I'll be that, as Mick said to, to Rocky, I'll be that angel on your shoulder, right? I'll be that person that telling you you can do it. And so I challenge you to that. Sign up today and do three acts of unsolicited kindness and see how those store game muscles develop in your life. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And Lord, I know the natural, the natural thing for us is to be rude. The natural thing for us is to be insensitive. The natural thing for us is just to consider how things around us affect us. But Lord, when we taste your gospel, when we experience your presence, when we allow Jesus to change us from the inside out, we understand that you call us to be loving. You call us to be kind. You call us to be considerate. You call us to be patient and compassionate. And so, Lord, help us to become those kinds of people that you dream for us to be. And I would ask, God, that you would, would empower these unsolicited acts of kindness that we're going to do this week to, to have incredible, incredible dividends, that we would see things that are eternal happen because we just show some kindness amongst our family, amongst our friends, amongst our community this week. These things we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet and join the band in this song. these pieces broken and scattered and mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing great how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see it now. See the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the broken to Set your treasure in jars of clay. So 
for just a few moments as we kind of share some information with you. I, I appreciate the practicality of this message from Pastor Tony today. Um, oftentimes, we're just surrounded by a world that is unforgiving and, uh, and rude, and sometimes uh, just to bring a, a little bit of love um, towards, uh, towards other people's lives is just to interrupt them with, with acts of, of great kindness and generosity. And so, I don't know about you, but I'm often taken off guard when someone just out of the blue just shows me um, some sort of kindness, right? And so we can make an impact on others, especially those that, that live with us and do life with us, um, that we can show kindness to them. So I hope that you will take up Pastor Tony's uh, challenge uh, this coming week. I love First John 4, 7. I mentioned at the very beginning, Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God. So... When you extend that act of kindness, know that you're doing it through the love of God, through you and in you, right? Just a couple of announcements coming your way. Uh, uh, on May the 22nd, which is several weeks from now, uh, there'll be two things happening that day. First, we'll be recognizing all graduates. So if you, have a, if you, if you are a graduate um, or you know someone in your family 
that is graduating um, from college or from high school, we would love to recognize them on uh, May uh, 22nd. So if you'll just text that person's uh, name and if they're and where they're graduating from and uh, if they're graduating from college, what degree they are obtaining to the number 417-860-5378. We will make sure that your graduate is recognized on that day. Also on May 22nd, we will be having a Northbridge luncheon after the second service. And I want to encourage you to be a part of that. If you if you have been attending with us for, for a while and you want to know more about what it means to own a Northbridge, to become a member of Northbridge, we would love to do lunch with you that day. And you can also sign up um, through the text on your screen. Now, let me say this. Nothing says love more than a guy walking around with a wiffle ball bat, right? Ready to hit somebody over the head with it. But um, I, I have this as a reminder that on June the 5th, um, we're going to have a family picnic and wiffle ball game right here on the field out here in the back area. We would love for you and your family to stick around after church on June 5th for a light uh, uh, picnic as well as just to have some fun with one another. Now, we are saying this is a family event because um, we are encouraging any ch- in anyone from the ages of five and up um, to, p- uh, p- to participate in the wiffle ball game. So you can do that by signing up in the, in the four-year area. Out here, there'll be a table. You can sign up there if you know Scott LaRue. Scott LaRue is actually organizing this, and so you can also talk to him. We just want you to show up. Um, there's a small group taking care of all the the ins and outs of this uh, wonderful event. And we just want you to come and enjoy yourself again June 5th after after worship service. Am I leaving? Oh, yeah, the 29th. Thank you very much. The 29th of May, uh, we will be having one service that day. That's the Memorial Day weekend. And we know that some of you will be out and about traveling around. um, But if you are in town on the May 29th, we'll have one service 10 a.m. So mark that on your calendar, 10 a.m., um, we will be providing uh, a kids zone as well as a nursery that that day. So come on out if you are in town and have a time of worship with your church family. Am I leaving anything out? That was a lot of announcements, Tony. We're we're coming into a busy part of our of our church calendar. So if you if you got anything that I said today, let me point my bat at you. Um, just go ahead and go to our Northbridge app, and you'll find all that information there. Just as as a reminder for you. All right. So. Uh, Do your acts of kindness to one another. Be kind, be loving, and uh, see what God will do through that. And with that said, you are dismissed. See you next week. Have a great week ahead.